Thank you, Tony and Addie. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 13 today? Acts chapter 13, I want to begin reading um, verse 23 of Acts chapter 13. You see our map there of uh, Paul's first missionary journey. You know, God has a great sense of humor as you're turning there. Um, I was thinking about short-term mission trips, and if you have been on a short-term mission trip, you know this is very true. Uh, There's one thing that's essential for every mission team, and it's this adaptability. We just saw that just a moment ago. You have to adapt. Uh, I was talking with Mike Johnson, and we were reminiscing about one of the trips to South America, and uh, Mike was leading a group, and we were building what was going to be a parsonage as well as a conference center for a church there in Brazil. And when Mike got there, he realized we weren't only going to lay block, but we had to prepare the block. We had to make the block. And you felt like uh, uh, Israel and Egypt when uh, they had to go get the straw. And, uh, but anyway, adaptability, um, it's just true wherever you've been. When you arrive on a, on a mission, a short-term mission excursion, you can't tell. You may get sick. You may, something may happen. I can remember one trip we took to Brazil, another trip. We've been on three in the past 20 years. Uh, we arrived and we had grand plans. We had collected lots of diapers and children things to distribute. We were going to head from Manaus down the Amazon to remote villages and take children's supplies to people that probably had never experienced that. Those were our plans, but our plans were frustrated because the small boat that we were going to travel, the generator broke down. You don't want to be heading down the Amazon on a boat without a generator. And so we had to stay in Manaus, the host city. And while we were there the very first night, someone unbeknownst to us or a group uh, invaded the deck of the boat and stole all of those supplies. We felt so terrible. But we resolved that we had no control over that. We did what we could do. We had to believe that God would take those supplies and use them even though they were uh, taken wrongly. And we had to get out on the streets of Manaus because we had a brief amount of time and we could not allow delay. If God did not open the door for us to go down the Amazon, we had to stay where we were and we had to minister. Today we're looking at Paul's short-term mission journey. Now granted it was a little longer uh, than our trip, but in Paul's first missionary journey, we see it described in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. Paul having ministered uh, there on the uh, southern island there of Cyprus, he and his team began to set out for Asia Minor. And when they arrived at Perga there in Pamphylia, uh, they had a hiccup. Young John Mark decided to return home. He was part of the team. And so uh, Paul and the team were having to adjust. There would be one fewer mouths to feed, but one more worker on the field. And and we're going to see how Paul responded in this in the short term. But then also I want us to look at the ministry that Paul carried out along with the team as they told his story. Look with me at Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 13. Paul and his companion set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, but John left them and went back to Jerusalem. They continued their journey from Perga and reached Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors, made the people prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out of it with a mighty arm. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. 
This all took about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king and testified about David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out all my will. From this man's descendants, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for opening up the truth of your word to us as you always do. And Father, we thank you for those portions of scripture that give us direct teaching. But Lord, along with that, we thank you that as part of your inerrant word, you give us narratives like we have today that we might learn about you, about the work, about how it applies to us. And so open our minds and our hearts that we might apply the truths we learn today in our situation. And we pray it in Jesus name. Amen. You know, Paul had three missionary journeys, and among those missionary journeys, uh, we see a, a, a number of things, but it's almost a misnomer uh, because it wasn't just Paul who was on the journey, but we see that Paul had another leader named Barnabas. Barnabas, uh, his name meant son of encouragement, and he was an encourager. In fact, Barnabas was the one who really introduced Paul into the first group of disciples and, and sort of put his stamp of approval approval on him. But along with Paul and Barnabas, there was also a team that traveled, and one of the members of that team was John Mark. John Mark was very young. He was much younger uh, than um, Paul and Barnabas, and when they left Cyprus and they arrived toward the mainland of Asia Minor, we see that John Mark left the mission. And so today, I really want to look at two main things. I want to look, and it's very interesting, it's only one part of one verse that mentions John Mark leaving the mission. But I do feel in, in light of all of the teaching of the New Testament, there's some important things that we can get from, from this event that happened. But, but then as we move from that, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see that in spite of the hiccup, in spite of the distraction, and could you imagine if you were on a team and then someone just abruptly had to leave, whether it be for medical reasons or whatever reason, obviously everybody would be looking around saying, what's going on? But I want you to see that in spite of that adjustment, that Paul and the team kept forth with their task. And so first I want you to note with me in verse 13, an early distraction, and that is John Mark uh, leaves the mission. Verse 13 says that Paul and his companions, they set sail from Paphos, came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and went back to Jerusalem. Now, as I said, John Mark was younger uh, than Paul and Barnabas. Uh, but John Mark actually accomplished many things. Uh, the second gospel, Mark, uh, actually was authored by John Mark. Also, we know that John Mark was a cousin to Barnabas, but not just that. He was a friend of the apostle Peter. He was very close to the Apostle Peter. We know that he came from a godly family. In fact, uh, the sending church was impacted by John Mark's family. So John Mark, while he was young, was really grounded in the faith. But for some reason, John Mark, who was part of the companions that accompanied Paul and Barnabas in this trip, decided to leave and go home to Jerusalem. It may have been that he was homesick. It may have been that really this mission was much more than he thought it was going to be longer. It may have been that he had a disagreement with the Apostle Paul, maybe the direction. We know that Paul and Barnabas didn't always see eye to eye. We'll see that in a moment. It may have been that. It may have just been that as he looked forward to the trip, he just felt like physically it would have been too taxing. We do not know why he left. We can only speculate, but the the fact of the matter is he did depart from the team. And Luke includes it here in Acts. And we know that it was a polarizing thing, at least between Paul and Barnabas, because a couple of 
uh, chapters later, as they finish the first journey, as they come back and report at Antioch, then later they prepare to go on a second journey. Barnabas goes to Paul and he says, okay, we're ready to go. Let's take John Mark with us. And Paul firmly said, no way. This isn't going to happen. In fact, Scripture said there was such a disagreement that Barnabas and Paul for that, for that season decided to part ways. Paul took Silas and went on his second journey. And Barnabas didn't just sit at home. He also went on his journey. So as we look at what is happening here in Acts chapter 13, in the short term, the team was adjusting to this change, and it was a hiccup. Obviously, there were more issues later when, when the two of them, Paul and Barnabas, sat down and hashed out what was going to go forward. But the thing I love about Scripture is this, and I want to look at four things really we can gain from this. The Bible does not omit or edit unseemly events. For instance, it didn't just overlook this fact that John Mark left, or two, two chapters later, here are two spiritual giants in a disagreement. If you and I were to write the story, we might have said, well, that isn't important. We won't include it. Uh, but I think it is important because it helps us to see the fallibility of Paul and Barnabas, the humanness. And the scripture doesn't keep us... Um, not knowledgeable of those things. But there's another thing that I think that we learn from this entire experience with John Mark and Paul and Barnabas' response. And it was this, Christians can and sometimes do disagree. You say, well, all you have to do is go to a Baptist uh, meeting and you know that. But we can and we do disagree. There's a difference between disagreeing and being disagreeable. And so in this case, uh, we see that it does happen. There's a third thing. Reconciliation is important. Whenever there is a severing, and there was really for a season with Paul and John Mark, uh, the, the, the desire of God is that reconciliation happen. The reconciliation happened in families. The reconciliation happened in the workplace. The reconciliation would happen among church members. And so here we see that Paul later was reconciled with John Mark. In fact, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, we see later that John Mark uh, was with Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the last epistle Paul wrote as he was nearing his death, he was asking for John Mark to come to him because he is useful to me. So Paul, when he's talking to Barnabas shortly after, is getting ready for a second journey. At that time he said, really, John Mark's not useful. Let's not take him. Later Paul saw him to be useful. And that leads to a fourth truth. Restoration can happen. John Mark is a testament to that. It can happen. That God can take someone who messes up, someone who, who stops when he should be going forward and still use him. God used him to minister to Paul. God used him to minister with Paul. God used him to write uh, the gospel of Mark, which we have even to this day. And in the same way that Peter was, was restored by Jesus, at the breakfast by the sea after Jesus' resurrection, we see that John Mark was restored into ministry. So as we looked at this subject of John Mark, and, and hopefully in 2024 we'll move on to the second and third missionary journeys, but for sake of what we're doing today, we understand the groundwork of what happened here. But I want you to see another important truth in light of uh, the immediate context here, and it's this that Paul and the team kept with the mission. We see that in verses 14 through 23. John's desertion was big enough, John Mark, that it would be discussed in the scripture that there would be a disagreement, but it was not so big as to stop the work that God had in store for that team. Luke mentions it briefly here in one verse, but the mission kept going. The train did not stop. And the point I want to bring out is this. It is so easy in our lives to be distracted from what's important and what's essential. 
It's important in, that we understand that, that we need to keep the main thing, the main thing, that God has given us ministries, God has given us uh, jobs, God has given us this, but the most important thing is that we glorify Him. And so I can imagine that team, and I can imagine the small team gathering around, and they're seeing uh, this one person who's gone, and they're saying, what do we do? And, and the picture I have in my mind is Paul saying, we're going to move forward. We're called to this particular work. So we see that Paul, why it caused him, at least for a short time, some friction with Barnabas, it did not deter him in the mission that God had given to him. And so from Perga, they traveled inland to Pisidian Antioch. And this is distinct from the Antioch of Syria. Just like there's a Concord Baptist Church in Charlotte County, and there's a Concord Baptist Church in Buckingham County, we have the same name, but yet we're in different counties. And so we see that the same name, Antioch in Syria, that same name, Antioch, is given to a, a, a place in and around Pisidia. And so we see, as we noted last week, that there was an itinerary. If you've ever been on a short-term mission trip, you don't just show up without a focus. You, uh, I can think of times when Mike and guys I've been with, as they are preparing to go on the trip, they begin to say, okay, what supplies do we need? What are we going to do? You make sure that either it's going to be there at the site or you take it with you. You have to be sure that they can get through customs and all of that. There is an order and a procedure. And many times we think, well, I'm just going to fly by the seat of my pants. I'm just going to do and God will show me what to do. No, there is a, a greatness in order. And so there was an order. There was a plan. And we see that plan again. And what is it? They went into the synagogues. They went into the Jewish place of worship. And there were both Jews and Gentiles there because when he addresses the group, he speaks to them first in verse 15, fellow Israelites. But then he says, and you who fear God. Now, the fellow Israelites were Jews. Those who feared God were those who were proselytes. They would have been non-Jews who believed in the true God and were coming there to hear the message that God had for them. And you may remember last week, Paul had that same itinerary. As he was on the island of Cyprus, the scripture says that he first went into uh, the synagogue. So what was he to do there? Well, there was an order even in the synagogue service, just as we have an order in our service today. We have music, the receiving of offerings, which itself is both are acts of worship. Usually we follow that with a message and then an invitation, a closing prayer, a special music placed in there. If you've been here long enough, almost with your eyes closed, you can understand there's an order. And again, order is good. And there was an order in the synagogue service. I was reading what John MacArthur shared about this in, 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 the comment, in commenting on this. He said, in the synagogue service, there would be the reciting of the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Everyone who was there would recite uh, uh, word by word uh, the Shema, hear, O Lord. And then after that, there would be the prayers, and they were called the tefillah. There were 18 of them. They were distinct. And so it wasn't just a quick prayer, but it was a prolonged time of prayer. And then after that, here in verse 15, um, we see, our, yeah, verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. So here in verse 15, we see that there was the reading of the law and the prophets. So if you were to go in that day into a synagogue service, you better know the Shema because you'll be asked to, to recite that. Then there would be the prayers. Then following that uh, would be the teaching from the Old Testament, the teaching from the prophets. And after that, someone would expound upon that. Now imagine here are Paul and Barnabas and they are visiting the synagogue. Synagogue. Word has gotten around uh, here in Pisidia and Antioch that we have guests. And all of a sudden, the one in charge says, Paul, would you come up and speak and expound? 
That was his mission. But I want you to see that Paul understood the context that he was given. You've heard the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. He didn't go off on a tangent. He understood the context, and this is important. They had just read from the law and the prophets. And Paul takes where they were, and by verse 23, he leads them to Jesus Christ. Now, how does this apply to us? Well, I don't think you and I are going to be invited to address a synagogue service anytime soon. In fact, I don't think I ever will. So, but how does this apply? There's a clear principle in this. Not only do we need to know the gospel, but we need to know the people we're going to share the gospel with. We need to connect the gospel practically to our hearers. So it means not just that we study the gospel and we as Christians need to understand the message of the gospel, the bad news that we are sinners, the good news that God loves us and has provided forgiveness through Jesus Christ who has risen from the dead and will give eternal life. But we also need to understand our listeners. Let me explain it this way. Ben Lehman, who's very dear to me, discipled me and personal evangelism. And whenever we would go and visit a home, if we didn't know the people, he said, Rick, just be alert to what's in the yard. If it's a nice boat, then you know what interests them. If there are a lot of toys, you understand that there are a lot of children in there. And what he's saying was this, try to understand the people that you're sharing with. In other words, Paul began sharing in familiar territory. He, he did not go all over his personal experience at this time, his Damascus Road experience, which was spectacular. But in that context, he started with the Old Testament and he began to share with them how the Old Testament led all the way to Jesus. And in the chart, we see all of that time period that's mentioned beginning in verse 16 and our 17 and following through all the way up to Jesus. We see the time periods that are listed there. I wonder today, are you burdened for people who don't know Christ? You see, John Mark left the mission, but the mission, we needed to stay focused. The gospel needs to go to people who haven't heard. And when the opportunity was given, Paul didn't go off on some tangent. He met them right where they were, and he led them to Jesus Christ. Paul knew the gospel, and he knew the congregation. He started with what they knew in order to lead them to know who they needed to know, and that is Jesus. Is that your desire? As we think about the opportunities God places to us, I love opportunities like Saturday because it gives us an opportunity to meet a need in our community for the purpose of sharing Christ. And so as we go out, you know, hey, don't, don't get me wrong. I love hanging with friends. I love seeing people. But when we're in a context like that, my eyes are beginning to look around and say, God, who are you bringing here? Why are you bringing that one? And, 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 and believe me, I, I'm not going to go to that person and talk about dispensational theology. I'm going to talk about how are you doing? Tell me about your family. What are, what are your interests? Trying to connect with those. Paul does that here. You see, the gospel is unchangeable. Its content doesn't change, but how we present it does change. Let me give you an example. This isn't the only history lesson of Israel that was given in the book of Acts. In fact, we see that Stephen in Acts chapter 7 uh, shared, and boy, he shared in a different tone and, uh, than what Paul shared here in Acts 13. Stephen shared the history of Israel, and then he sort of summed things up by saying to the Jewish listeners, you killed Jesus. And it's no wonder he got stoned, all right? But Paul was different here. Paul's method is milder. Why is that? Well, I think in part because when he was invited at the end of uh, verse 15, they are saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement to the people, you can speak. In other words, he's speaking to a receptive audience. 
He's, sp he's speaking to people that want to hear it. Now, Paul wasn't weak spaghetti. It wasn't that Stephen's, hey, anybody that knows the Apostle Paul, man, he stood tough even against the Apostle Peter at one time. He, he stood strong even on this issue with John Mark. But in this context, he felt there was a receptivity. And so he began to preach Christ. But, but he had to set the table with what they could understand in order to share Christ. And there were really uh, three things that he did. First, he speaks of God's initiating love. Look at verse 17. The God of this people, Israel. So Paul is standing up in the synagogue there chose our ancestors. Notice the initiative that God takes. In other words, while uh, Stephen, uh, a, few, a while earlier, was speaking the word, you killed Jesus, Paul is saying, God loves you. He's speaking of God's gracious love, and the whole tone of his message speaks of God's grace. We've been studying on Wednesday evenings about Israel and how God chose Abram, not out of a righteous family, but out of a pagan family. And he chose him out of paganism, and it was totally a work of the grace of God. And so Paul is saying to you Jews who feel that you're God's people, understand this. It is God who initiated that love. In Ezekiel chapter 16, I wish we had time to sit down on that today, but I'd encourage you to read it later. But in the first seven verses of Ezekiel chapter 17, or 16, rather in the Old Testament, chapter 16, it speaks of God finding Israel as an unclean, uncared for baby and how he took and nurtured it. And, and he speaks metaphorically there. And so in the same way, in the same vein here, he's saying, you were nobody, your ancestors were nobody, and God took the initiative. But secondly, he speaks of God's provisional and protective love. Here in verses 17 and 19 through 20, he says, God takes the initiative. And then he follows, but not, not just that, but saying, he prospered them. He prospered your forefathers when they were in Egypt, and he brought them out. He destroyed the enemies that were in the promised land and gave them the land. Then he gave them judges to deliver them out of the consequences of their own sin. And he even gave them what they asked for, a king. And God is the active one. He, he's the one who is acting kindly toward the nation. Going back to Ezekiel chapter 16, the prophet there speaks of God taking Israel and clothing her, protecting her from vile lovers, quote and unquote, and adorning her with beautiful things, God's favor. And so what is Paul saying to the church here? Before you knew him, before your forefathers knew him, God loved you and God took action toward you. He initiated. Not only that, God is providing and he's protecting you. But then he speaks thirdly of God's patient love. Look at verse 18. He says, and for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. God was patient. God had delivered uh, Israel out of Egypt, and his desire was that they go into the promised land. But through unbelief, they did not immediately go. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. But the scripture tells us that while they were wandering for those 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out, nor their shoes. Man, that's amazing. We talked about a miracle. That's a miracle. Man, I can't keep a pair of shoes for for a year and it wears out, but God provided for them his patient love. And that's what God did. And the people understood it. In the Feast of Booths, this same group every year would observe the fe Feast of Tabernacle or Booths. And, and throughout the city around Jerusalem, you would see vast temporary structures like tents that were set out as they uh, reminisced God's protection during that time when they had no solid place to live. And so God loved them. He was patient toward them. Going back to Ezekiel 16, and I would encourage you to go back and look at it. As the prophet there depicts, and he metaphorically speaks of Israel as that baby that was taken when it was helpless, that was clothed, was protected. He goes on to say, that that child played the prostitute, but how God kept his covenant and brought it back, which was a picture of his love 
for the people. Listen to me today. People need to know that Jesus Christ loves them. They need to see it in our actions and in our hearts. They need to hear it with their ears. Uh, we need to minister, but we need to clearly help people understand God loves you. You know, whenever I've shared the gospel, it begins with God loves. That's the way I was trained. And I think there's a great theology in it because we're sinners and that's part of the story. But first we need to understand God loves us and we have value. We're created in the image of God, but we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God that we fall short. And, and, and the, the wonderful message of the gospel is this God provided one answer and his name is Jesus. He died on the cross, his redemption. He paid the price for our sin and he rose again triumphantly. We're going to look more at this message next week, but I want you to see everything that Paul is doing is pointing to Jesus. Let me ask you about your life and your work and your ministry. Is that your desire to point people to Jesus? I love that in spite of the hiccup here, with this distraction, they kept on the path of the mission. Do you realize you and I have a mission? God has called us to share Christ with our friends, with our neighbors. Let me encourage you again, as we move toward next week, which is a great time. Have you ever thought what it's like? I went to a funeral one time and I arrived a little bit late. And, and when I arrived, I'm a preacher, and I was marched up to the front of the church. I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. And here I am. I've been in church all my life, and I felt uncomfortable because I arrived late. But yet, we don't often think it may be uncomfortable for somebody who's not been in church to come in these walls. What does that tell us? We need to greet them, not overwhelm them. Just say, hey, it's good to see you. But do you realize, too, that Saturday night is a great environment because all of us like to eat. We're out in the open air. It's a great opportunity to be intentional on mission as Paul was here. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, I thank you for these narratives and what we can learn from them. Father, I, I've been on trips. There have been others here, intentional mission trips that have had unexpected, maybe a change in schedule, maybe supplies that are needed, that are not provided, that need to be manufactured. Um, but Father, we thank you that in all of these things that you can keep us on task. But Lord, the same thing in this microcosm of a short-term mission trip is also true in our lives. Lord, there'll be distractions. There'll be things that come up. Forgive us when we allow ourselves to be taken off of task on that. Keep us mindful, God, that you give us air to breathe. You give us a ministry. That we might share Christ. So, Lord, speak in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen.